First of all, uh, I want to welcome family and friends of the elected officials. We have many of you here. Uh, we sincerely appreciate you being here today and know that uh, this is a team sport. Uh, it's not just the leader uh, that's on the team. It's your friends, it's your family, uh, it's your spouses, your significant others. And I just want to take a moment to recognize all of you by recognizing my own wife, Cheryl, who's been the leader of Team Bosma for a long time. Thank you. Very much. I also want to give a special welcome and thanks to the teachers uh, that are here today. However many thousand it ended up being, it's a lot. Welcome. Uh, we are. We appreciate you being here. educators on the first floor here as well and if you have been or are or have been a teacher on a school board have worked for a school corporation or a school would you please rise and let us recognize you as well Sean and I have 15 educators, former and current, in our family, including both of our mothers, our, my mother-in-law, Jean, right here, who taught for nearly 40 years in the Perry Meridian, Meridian Middle School, uh, and now our daughter, Allison Ailes, who's teaching the fourth grade, and I believe she and her class in Loveland, Colorado, are watching this right now. So, Mrs. Ailes and your team, good to have you on board. I would not want to be in that classroom, I gotta tell you. <laughs> Strict. I said that about the 15 teachers because many of us, especially our family, understands that you are the most important professional for our state's future. And I don't mean just in the classroom. You are the closest to our greatest natural resource, our children. You teach them daily, you inspire them, and we appreciate you truly. I even found out that my junior prom date uh, is now teaching and was here, and we got to say hi to each other just a little bit ago. So. Susan Johnson, wherever you are, it was great to see you again after 43 years. We understand that the job of teachers has changed as well. It's not just unruly kids talking out of turn or maybe singing a song in class. I was known to have done this twice. You've got 21st century problems. It's kids without food, many without parents, many with very dysfunctional, uninvolved, or destructive families, and we understand you're called upon to do a lot. We also understand the reams of bureaucratic paperwork that are required and have tried to address that in the past, and we will again. And you have a concern that wasn't a concern when I was in school or when my mother taught school, and that's violence and not just your students' safety, but your own safety as well. We understand these are big challenges, and I know many of you think legislators don't get it. We do. We may not get it as well as you do, but we talk with enough of you to know. Our constant goal over the last 10 years, and I look back through every speech I've given here for the last uh, 12 and the last 16 years as speaker, each one talked about the importance of teachers. Each one talked about the need to cut red tape and to give them resources and flexibility to inspire students, keep them safe, and empowerment of teachers to teach. We'll get back to the teachers in just a little bit because I want to talk specifically to you. Now to the session ahead. While it seems most everyone in Washington, D.C. has lost their minds, I say most, because immediately, even when I said that yesterday, the press asked if I was including Vice President Pence in this. Still trying to drive that wedge. I said, no, everybody but Mike Pence is crazy in Washington, D.C. 
and they're ignoring critical issues. And there are important issues to Hoosiers that are languishing now while both sides are engaged in the battle they're engaged in. The North American Free Trade Agreement, or USMCA, is so important to Hoosier farmers and the ag industry, it's critical. Smart immigration reform is important to not just our ag community, but our workforce here to make sense of this. And unlike us here in Indiana, the, the federal budget is so out of balance and it doesn't seem anybody's doing anything about it. Here in Indiana, we're going to remain on the right track. In my first session in 1987, I was sitting right about where, I don't know if that was Representative Jordan, Jordan. It's right about where, oh, it is where Representative Jordan is sitting. I was sitting right there, backbencher. I don't know if you knew you were a backbencher, but you are. <laughs> and I clearly knew it in 1987. And a few of you that were here will recall that we honored Father Theodore Hesburgh here in uh, the chamber after his 35 years of service as the president of Notre Dame. And you may not know this about me, but I write down things that are said. I've written down some of the crazy or humorous things you all have said, too. I'll show, show that with you another time. But I wrote down a couple of things that Father Hesburgh said that day. He said, the very essence of leadership is that you have a vision. It's got to be a vision you articulate clearly and forcefully on every occasion. You cannot blow an uncertain trumpet. And I took that to heart. Never forgot the statement. And I tried to lead my team and our state and this chamber in a clearly articulated course ever since. A little more than a decade ago, and I'm not going to go through all the details, but it's worth saying, a little more than a decade ago, we dragged the nation in government transparency, job creation, technology, parents' voice in their children's education, our business tax environment, road infrastructure, and especially fiscal discipline. <laughs> when I made a practice of calling these things, again, just thinking about over these many years, uh, when I made a practice of pointing these statistics out, both here and uh, in the public, a former uh, Democrat governor was approached by the media and going through these details. So what do you say about this? They said, well, I'm a glass half full kind of guy and apparently Representative Bosma is a glass half empty kind of guy. And then when I was approached by the media to respond to the response, my response was, why does Indiana have to settle for half a glass? And we've worked hard together to make Indiana's glass full ever since. Because of the hard work and vision articulated in this chamber over the last 15 years, clearly and forcefully, as Father Hesper would say, while we're not perfect, Indiana is really the envy of the nation on the fiscal and business front. We're one of 12 states with a AAA credit rating. We have the lowest unemployment in nearly 20 years, and at 3.2%, it's lower than all of our surrounding states, and then that's significantly low, below the national average. We have strong financial reserves, our buffer against uh, eminent downturn. At some point in the future, it will happen. We're rated as number one in the Midwest for business, job creation, economic momentum, tax environment, and on the short list nationally by nearly a dozen organizations, from the Tax Foundation to business facilities, Best Business Climate, Ratings, Forbes, Chief Executive Magazine, CNBC, and many more. With the Energizer battery factory uh, that has just been, facility rather, that has just been announced in uh, southern, south here of central Indiana, with the Salesforce move to Indianapolis and the Infosys Training Center that's going to bring 10,000 technology jobs to Indiana, we're almost there. One of the things I've been telling some people here, I've checked a lot of boxes here. One of them that I was disappointed that didn't get checked over the last 20 years was making Indiana the Midwest tech hub. I heard yesterday the president of Infosys, as he's talking about the new facility uh, in Franklin, refer to central Indiana as the tech hub for the Midwest. We also now rank second in the nation in the growth of software jobs. We've downsized government, we've reduced burdensome regulations, we've eliminated dozens of boards and hundreds of bureaucratic positions, 
And now we're rated, we're rated number three in regulatory environment in the nation by Forbes and number five by the Cato Institute. On the infrastructure front, we had some hard fought battles in 2016 and 2017 to try to get not everybody in this chamber, but especially people on the other side of the hall, to look at investment in infrastructure as an investment in the future and not just an expense item. If you haven't noticed those orange barrels all over the place, I keep telling my family, don't worry, it will get better. But we're the only state in the nation with a 20-year fully funded road program with no debt on our children. Downsized government, uh, we eliminated waste, we paid off $2.5 billion in outstanding debt, which makes the uh, revenue stream all the better in the future. We've cut taxes 14, or eliminated them 14 times in the last 15 years, including the largest tax cut in our state's history and the lowest property taxes in the Midwest, and that's a record we can all be proud of. 